But what I found is, is that is that when people, no matter what your race is or anything like that, once you get comfortable with me, the difference in us washes away. You only see you, and that's whether you're white or whether you're black. You know, and so that's the way it's worked for me throughout my life. So, when you're seeing how predestined for based on your life, you left us and went back to my life. No. What you did at that period of time? This is, okay, so where they, they're going to run seamlessly together. So where the second one uh, will pick up is exactly where Picktown ends. And then where that one ends, the third one will pick up. So, yeah, we're going to go through this whole thing of exactly what was going on. And the second one is actually a very good balance between Atlanta and Baltimore. So it's I've already started writing it So it, because I was going back and forth during the time. So you'll see, you know, you'll see a lot more heightened things that are going on because now Antonio is out. And in the first book, you didn't get a chance to really meet him. He was like in the background and like a phantom to the whole thing. Yeah. You know, he was he was the reason for all of this going on. And in the second one, now it's he and I as a team. So you'll get to see more of that relationship that wasn't shown in the first book. Anything else? Yeah, so the book read so much like a movie. Is that something you would be interested in pursuing? Television. 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 I could, out of three books, um, I already have uh, two pilots and what I want, two different types of pilots depending on which direction. And now what I want to do is take both the pilots and mash them up and make one other one. So by the time it's all over, it'll be three. But I think the one that's the mixture of the two is the one that I would probably be saying to. But with all three books, I could do um, five seasons of one hour wow. program. Yeah. And I'm working with some people on that as now, now as well. How exciting! We'll see. Do you think that like whatever is produced will, will be a, a good reflection of Big Down or the reality? Or um, are they going to floss it up? The, hmm, that's a good question. The, what I would, what in, in that, what I would try to do and what, this was my thing, I've been broke all my life. So I'm not in a rush to make wrong money, okay? This is my story. I waited over 40 years to begin to tell my story. So the reason that I didn't wait on trying to find a publishing company is because I didn't, you know, rule of thumb is first book is theirs, you make no money off of it, second book is a joint project, and the third book is yours. But this is, you know, I have a 26-year-old daughter, this is my other daughter, and then there's going to be more that come behind her. So my thing was is that I, if I only sold two books and made $20, I'd be happier than going with a publishing company and you know, watching them get rich off of my story. I feel the same exact way about this, about anything that has to do with this book. Yeah. If it's not my voice, I was the reason it took me so long to edit it is because I needed people that I could trust that would not try to change the voice, you know? So, and I feel the same way about um, the television project right now, is that anybody who wants to come on, you have to understand that this is mine and that there's a certain cadence to it. And, you know, I mean, I literally phonically write the, write the accent, write the Baltimore accent, I write the phrasing, I do everything because it's so much, you know, a character of the story. And, you know, like I look at, you know, The Wire and how they had to bring people, you know, regular ordinary people, they had to bring them into it because there's no other place like this. You're not going to hear that accent any place else in this world. And because of that, you have to protect the book because this culture is something that you don't see everywhere. You know, and I'm protective over it. So if it does go there and the choice was, okay, we just want to use the book and you don't have anything to do with it, then the answer is no. Because you're not going to bubble gum my story, you know, and so many other people's stories to 
facilitate what it is you're trying to get across. I've been broke. I don't need the money. So if I needed it, I would have had it. <laughs> so he touched upon, oh, sorry. Uh, he briefly mentioned gentrification, I guess, that you see mm -hmm. happening in Pink Town. Um, it's what happening you, in Atlanta, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, everywhere. Yeah. Big yeah. city. Yeah. But what do you think the city as a whole, Baltimore, or namely a pink town, uh, can do to, quote unquote, improve without pushing everyone out? Education. That's, that's all there is to it. It's the edu if, if it doesn't start with the education system, then everything else is for nothing because, you know, you can have all the best intentions in the world, but if you don't have anybody, that, if you don't have children that are going to step up and stay in their city and rebuild it along with everybody else, then it doesn't make a difference if you rebuild it. White people can move here and they can build the schools up around them, but what are they going to do where they put the people that were here before? So, and what do their schools look like? So just shifting everybody around is not going to make a difference. The engine, I read last year, over the winter, that these kids went to school for weeks without heat in the winter. And it's like, that is bizarre. So how do you learn under those conditions? It goes back to, you can't tell a hungry man about God, because all he hears is his stomach growling. You've got children that are hungry and, you know, don't come from the best environments, and now they come to school to learn and to get away from maybe a reality that they that they don't deserve, but they're born into, and then they got freeze to death in school and be hungry and try to learn. And vice yeah. versa, when they had the heat wave, they had to shut the school down because they didn't have air Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah, it's like that's to me. That's where everything stems. If you had a good education system in in Pig Town, there would have been no room for gentrification. You know, you shut down the you shut down the you know the uh, the slaughterhouses and, and the plants that were here. That's how you know it came from what I know of Big Town. It was an upper middle class working neighborhood, and then all of the you know industry was you know moved out and pushed on, and they left a whole bunch of people around. So now you got idle hands. Idle hands do what? Wind up getting into trouble. And then the neighborhood changes. Because it's still the same people and still the same families and they were still hard working and now there's nothing to work. You know, there's no place to work. So it's Yeah. And people, you know, I don't say I know everything, but I know that drugs were moved into some neighborhoods to destroy the neighborhood and the culture. Like upwardly mobile families when you have the drugs pumped into your neighborhood, um, and it's bigger than you as a little dealer then that's going to start to erode at the family level. This is a sad part that I realized in Baltimore. You can get heroin and crack and can't find vegetables. It's, and the food is, <laughs> you can't, you can't, I mean, I used to, my favorite line was, do y'all serve fucking salads? Does anybody have salads? <laughs> Plenty of French fries. You get French fries with gravy. You get French fries with cheese. You can, get, you can get any kind of carbohydrate. You can't find a vegetable. And what kind of salad do you like? Oh, I like mixed you like, greens. You like, like spinach? No, I like spinach. You spinach like, you, it's just spinach. Oh, it's <laughs> but that's, you know, but that's what oh, I said. And then a friend of mine from Atlanta came up here yeah. and she knew that I, she knew that I used to stay here. And she calls me up and she's like, hey, can I ask you a question? And I said, what? She said, do they serve vegetables here? And I started laughing because I used to say the same, it's like you can't find vegetables. And then if you do find a salad, it's iceberg lettuce, which has no nutritional value. Sorry, I'm a restaurant person, so I know that, you know. But yeah, it has no nutritional value in it, so really what do you want it for? So it's like, you know, like those, those are the things that I've been noticing. So you mentioned a couple times that the children used to be out in the street, and you say that positively. Play. 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 Okay. Play. Yeah. Right. So like in Atlanta, okay, so in Atlanta, kids get shipped everywhere. So your parents get in the car, and then they take you to a destination. There is no neighborhood community of kids, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, in, in that aspect. 
and when I was a little girl, that's what we used to do. I lived in this huge building mm -hmm. where, you know, we had our own playground that was like four city blocks, you know, long and wide. Mm -hmm. So we had a place to, you know, commiserate. In Atlanta, it's a different thing. Here, you see, you know, in the summertime, it'd be 20 to 30 kids all on their bikes riding through neighborhoods. And to me, I love that because that is community. Mm -hmm. All of those kids are going to grow up together. You know what I mean? And those are all positive things, no matter what their life, you know, throws at them. You know, from that, you know, from that day on, they still had themselves as a community, and they still had other kids that they played with. And that's just something that I don't, you know, as grown, once I moved to Atlanta when I was ten. You know, we didn't really see that anymore. That was something that was in New York. So when I used to see like 20 million kids outside playing, it was like, oh yeah, this is like, you know, this is what it's supposed to be about. Your, your whole, you know, if little Johnny is outside getting in trouble, then when I was growing up, my grandmother, my grandmother's friends, everybody had a right to say, eh, and you got in trouble. They would, they give you a dis, you know, they tell you, get on you about it, and then they tell your grandmother, and you, would, and that's the way it was here. You know what I mean? And you had, you know, everybody had respect for the older people, and yeah, it was just a fair sense of community. They always knew who the other one was. You know, that such and such is kid, and they belong to such and such, and that's their grandmother, and those are all their aunts and uncles, and yeah, I just love that about you. So, as far as your education, like how far did you go to school? Oh, uh, I completed the ninth grade. I completed the ninth grade. Like, are you self-educated? Did you just sound like you went to college or something? No, thank you. No, what it was is that, um, so I was, uh, at first it was arrogance. That's the first way that it came out once I was on my own because I didn't want everybody to know that I didn't know anything. Okay, so I came out with, I know everything. And people didn't like that. So I wound up ostracizing myself. And then I realized, all right, if I start reading and picking up on things, then I won't sound like I only have a ninth grade education. I wound up getting my GED when I was 20, I think I was. I just literally stumbled into taking my GED and almost scored a perfect score. I think I was like 22 points off a of perfect score. So, yeah, just reading everything and just making sure that that wasn't my downfall. You know, and I was always, it's like for me, even when I was in school, my mother didn't, you know, make sure that we went to school or anything like that. From the time I was in the first grade, education wasn't important, nothing like that. But I generally, it was something else to do, and so by the time I was in high school, I got kicked out of the school for uh, not coming to school, but I had a 3.4 grade point average when they kicked me out because I would only show up on test days. Those were the only days that I wanted to be there. So I'd come in, I'd take my test, go eat lunch, if I had another test, I'd go in, peek in, see some teachers, and then I'd bounce. Tests were always the same days. It was Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. So those were the days that I went to school. And then they kicked me out for uh, being truant. Okay. And it was funny because I remember when he was giving me, when the, when the vice principal was giving me the speech, and he was here, and the window is here, and my house was not too far away. And I'm looking in the direction of my house, and I'm thinking to myself, I wonder if the police are going to kick in the door today. And those are the things that, but these people didn't have any clue about what was going on in my life. All they knew is I just, you know, didn't show up to school, and they didn't understand why, especially with the grades that I was getting. And then the same year, uh, we took the standardized testing, and I scored in the 95 percentile of the state of Georgia for creative writing. And the, what the, the counselor, I get called into, I was in school that day, and they called me to the office and she's explaining, to, she's telling me, she's not explaining anything to me. You know, she's talking about the testing and I'm like, okay. And I think I was like 16. And she says, you know, you scored in the 95 percentile. And I said, okay. And she says, do you know what that means? And I said, you just told me it's the 95 percentile. She said, you're in the top 5% of people in the entire state. Okay, and I'm looking at her like, if she would have said to me, this can get you into college. 
it would have been a completely different conversation. But she's looking at me like I'm stupid. Like, how do you not understand this? But she doesn't realize that I have so many real world problems in my 16 year old brain that what she's telling me doesn't compute to me. All I know is, if I go home today, police might be in the house. If I go to lay down tonight to go to sleep, there's a good likelihood that before I wake up, the police will kick in the door. That's how I'll wake up. And those that's the way that I lived. So she did, you know, and I think about that day so many times because that could have been my out. You know, had someone said, yeah, this, this writing thing you're doing, yeah, this can get you out. Because, like I said, when I was a kid, that is what I wanted to do. But that had been buried so deep down, you know, by the time I was 10 years old, that was just gone. It was just gone. And I always wrote, I always had diaries and wrote short stories. One of the things I used to do when I was in high school, I was in eighth grade. I used to write love notes from one janky teacher to the other. Mm -hmm. So it would be like a love note from like the disabled vice principal that was like really nerdy and you know square, and the very masculine female uh, gym teacher, and it would be a love note from him to her, and then I would fold it up and just throw it on the ground, and throw it on the floor in the school because you know if you see somebody's note. You're going to pick it up and scoop it, and then it would be a love note, and it was obvious that it wasn't really from them. <laughs> but those are the things that I used to do, and I used to always write short stories and poetry. And My older brother, when he was in the military, he would call me up, and he would say things like, um, he'd give me an abstract sentence, right? Mm -hmm. And then when he'd, he'd give me an abstract sentence, then the challenge was for me to write a poem to it. Mm -hmm. and you know, so those were like the little mind games, you know, and little things. And I used to have like duffel bags of uh, things that I wrote. And over the years, I've just lost all of it. So do you feel like your brother escaped what you went through because he joined the military? Um, my brother, okay, so my oldest brother, he, uh, he thinks that because we had our first three years of life were so drastically different that that's where he and I separate. Um, his relationship with our parents was a lot different than mine was, um, especially with our mother. Um, my mother was, my mother's whole thing is, is, you know, she got a boy and, you know, he's her favorite and it was always that way. And it was always him pitting her pitting him and me against each other. So it was a completely different dynamic. My brother asked me to go into the military with him, but I wouldn't do it because I didn't want to get up early in the morning. That's never, I, and that was my reason. And then years later, I was like, damn, that, I really messed up not doing that. I should have done it because it was a different avenue from where I went. He went into the military and I went to live on a train in New York. I went to ride the trains and sleep on the trains in New York. So it was completely two different realities and then I got so wild in New York that my family got me drunk on my 21st birthday really drunk and then put me on a train to South Carolina where I passed out on the train and didn't wake up for 20 hours <laughs> and people thought I was dead so that was their way of saying all right it's a little bit too dangerous for you here and then they shipped me off to be with my go help my brother with his babies and his wife go help my family out with their kids. So, and yeah, it, it just calmed me down for about 30, 40 minutes and that was it. I was just, because I didn't know, the, there's a difference between surviving and existing. And I was so, between living and existing. And I was so used to existing that it wasn't until I was in my 40s that it, that it was, okay, now it's time to live. And a lot of therapy. I can't say that enough. A lot of therapy. You got a question? No, I'm good. Oh, is this better? Can you hear me? I think it turns off. I can hear you without it on. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Do you want me to fix it again? Huh? Is this good? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Could you hear me before? 
Okay, mother threatened to sue me. I know that's right. <laughs> she threatened to sue me. Um, but she also, she threatened to sue me and my response to her was, uh, there's a lot of Carmens in the world. If you want to call yourself out, feel free. But she also thought that it was about my childhood. So she feels a way about me writing about that. So we had to talk about that and I let her know, you know, yeah, I'm not, I'm not interested in writing about that. Um, my daughter, actually just finished reading the book a few weeks ago. Um, it took her a minute to read it strictly because she doesn't know me in that light. Um, so yeah, so she went through it and once, she, so she finally got to the point where she could separate the character from me. And then, you know, and then after she was able, you know, after she was able to do that and she went through the book, she actually enjoyed the book. She thought it was a good story. No, I didn't bring her until the summer. Right. Yeah. After he came home, that's when she was able to come up. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you a number. She can talk to you about it. But yeah, she had, and, and there was a reason. So, with with my daughter, she lived with her father, and her father was in the military, and she was with him and his wife, and. That was partly, it was selfish reasons on my behalf because I knew, and my biggest fear was, if I had her, I'd fuck her up. You know what I mean? Because of what my life was, because I didn't know, you know, I didn't know anything else and I didn't want to take that chance of doing to her what was done to me. So that's why she was separated. And then when she was a little bit, when she was older, I wanted her to meet everybody because everybody here was great people. And it was like, no, I want you to be, this is, you know, these are the people that I want you to be. And she came up here and she had a ball and she still has friends from here from that summer. And, you know what I mean, and she still keeps up with people and it's like, you know, it is what it is. And yet, you know, so yeah, so for her, it was, you know, oh wow, that's what she would do. <laughs> you know what I mean? She had no, she was like, that's what, okay. Mom was wilding out. Yeah, <laughs> and then she was telling me some story the other day, like a few weeks ago, she was telling me this story about it. She was like, yeah, because remember when I used to think that you were in music? And I was like, and she's like, yeah, now I know. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah. So, yeah. But yeah, that was her response. And yeah, my mother, you know, I don't, we haven't talked about, uh, we haven't talked about her response, you know, about the book as far as since it's been published, but I don't, that's not my concern. You know what I mean? This is about what I was doing and what my dream was about being an author and me bringing that to fruition for that. And I think you're, you're very transparent because some people would hide that whole part of their life, just, you know, when they change. Mm -hmm. They would try to squash that, but maybe the transparency is going to help somebody else, or even you to continue to heal from all that trauma. I do use it as therapy. Yeah. I do use it as therapy, and one of the other things, too, is like, for me, it's like, like my mother was like, you don't know what to say out of your mouth. I don't feel that there's a reason to be ashamed about anything, because if I didn't go through those things, I wouldn't have met the people that I met, and I wouldn't have had the influences that I had, and I wouldn't have gotten the kindness that I got, because I didn't come from a household of kindness. You know what I mean? I came from completely opposite. So I got more kindness in this neighborhood than I've gotten out of a lot of people in my family. So I learned a lot about myself, I learned a lot about people, I've learned a lot of trust issues, you know what I mean, have gone away, you know, and I've learned who I can let into my circle and who I can't. So we all have issues, we all have baggage, and so long as you're still running from it, and so long as you're looking at it like it's something to be ashamed of, then that means you haven't grown past it. You know, because everybody has issues, and you know, it doesn't matter the degree of it, wrong is wrong, you know what I mean? So, yeah, I could have been doing a lot worse, but I could have also been doing a lot better. I'm doing a lot better now. But yeah, then to me it was all about, you know, how do I survive? How do I eat? How do I, you know, 
No, um, the reason why is, as you know, I don't like cold weather. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I don't come out in the winter time. It's yeah, no. Uh -uh. So yeah, so to me, Atlanta's getting too cold for me now. We only have two seasons, but it's still getting too cold for me. And in two, I'm looking at two years, I'll be in Saint Croix. Okay. Saint Croix. Oh. Yeah. So that's that. But other than that, no, I come up here. Like I've been here more times than I've been to New York. And you know what I mean. So yeah. So I've seen y'all more than I've actually seen my own family. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Anything else? Um, so, yes. are you? Gotcha. Selling your book tonight? <laughs> yes, I am selling the book. Uh, I'm doing an old major special of ten dollars per copy. And did you get an original copy? Yeah, I get for mine. Go ahead. So you got the first one? Yeah. So you got the one with the typos? No. Okay, cool. All right, I got you. So ten dollars. I do take cards. So if you don't have cash, that's not a problem. Um, if there is one other thing that I could read, I would really like to read it if y'all don't mind. Yeah. Is that cool? Yeah. So, this is the dedication, because I think the dedication answers a lot of questions that we were just, a lot of things that we were talking about. Okay, can you hear me? For far too long, I tried to hide from, uh, I tried to hide from my dream of being a writer. I buried it so far down in me, I didn't remember I even had a dream. I walked around trying to attach myself to others' dreams and assist them in what they wanted to achieve. In return, I got my heart broken more than a few times. I sold drugs to make a living in hopes that I could make enough money to run away to an island and live quietly. The only problem with that is, it was stupid and futile. There is no retirement plan in drug dealing, not one that doesn't include a penitentiary. My friends have always told me I should write a book about my life. I tried writing that book a few times, always quickly losing interest. The life they were talking about was my life as a child and what I had endured during those years. I'm not interested in writing about those years, so I didn't write anything. I missed writing. I had always written poetry and short stories all through school. Once I was in my 30s, I stopped completely. I don't know why. I guess the world had gotten to me and, it drank, and, and I drowned it deep down there where a person places the confidence they once had as a doe-eyed kid and left it there for a better part of a decade. But I missed it every day of that decade. I saw myself writing a book, but the pages were empty because I didn't know what I was going to write about. One day I was on the phone and the person I was talking to told me a friend of his who had recently written a book and got it published while the author was in prison. He told me I should write a book of my own. At first I had a slick comment, but then the story I wanted to tell literally just popped into my head. That night I started writing Pigtown Chronicles, and 15 weeks later, and in 15 weeks I had written my first book. I was a new person. I had completed my, the first part of my lifelong dream. The second part of that dream is to share it with you. I want to dedicate this book first and foremost to my grandmother Elaine and my daughter Jasmine, the Alpha and Omega of my very existence, the two most important people in my life, my Aunt Nikki for teaching me calmness, my Aunt Lisa for being my moral compass. Next, my brothers, Kenny, Kareem, Maureen, and Tupac. You are the trampoline that catches my falls every time I jump into the world. Finally, I want to dedicate this book to everyone who has had their dream buried deep within them, for whatever reason it has been. This book is tangible proof that you can live your dream. This book is my dream, and after all that life has thrown at me, I still wrote it. Not for anyone other than me. Not for any other reason, but this is my dream. If I am the only person to ever read this book, I will pass through this life with a smile on my face simply because I wrote my book.